Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Quantum Bridge uh, with myself, Casper, my co-host, Gary. Hi, Gary. Hi, Casper. <laughs> and today we're very fortunate to be joined by a brand new guest, uh, certainly to us at least, um, a guy called Franco Romero. And um, we don't have any idea where this conversation will take us. And we're particularly pleased that we don't have any idea. So mm -hmm. before I go on anymore, I'm going to turn over to Franco to say hi, maybe give a quick bit of background. And even before that, hi, Franco. Really good. Hello. Of you to Hello. Welcome to the show, Hello. Franco. <laughs> yeah, welcome. see you guys. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's lovely to have you. So, if you wouldn't mind, um, obviously, we, Gary and I, know something about you, not that much. Uh, and we've been fortunate enough to have a few minutes before this recording to get to know each other a bit, which was really lovely. Um, we were brought together by Shoshi Hersku, who's been, um, who's a mutual friend and also has been on our, our show uh, a couple of times now, too. So, um, yeah, Franco, if you don't mind, if you just give a little bit of background to yourself and where you are in the world, and we'll go from there. Okay. So as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from, from your neck of the woods. Um, I'm in Minnesota in the U.S., the Twin Cities, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And I've been living here for a sizable amount of time of my life. I was originally living in Chicago. Uh, which is not very far from here. It's about five or six hour drive. And in the last 25 years or so, 30, I've been living now here in, in Minnesota. Um, I originally was born in South America, in Colombia, specifically Bogota, Colombia. And, um, and my story kind of begins there, but I want to absolutely make sure we have time to talk about some other stuff. So I will just basically say that at the age of six months, uh, I had a near-death experience that I was not aware of until much later in life. And when I mean by much later, it was probably around about 15, 16 years of age. And the way I became aware of it was because by that time, I had already experienced a lifetime full of very odd situations in my life very clairvoyant, and in some cases, very paranormal um, experiences, which I just growing up thought it were very normal. And so to just really quickly share a little bit about my near-death experience, when I was six months old, um, I was taken to the hospital because I was having upper respiratory conditions where I couldn't breathe very well. It, it didn't take very long when I was there um, to realize that I was having, um, that I was experiencing a pretty severe case of pneumonia. And within just several hours of being admitted into the hospital, I was, um, I was, well, I wasn't, but my mother was, was told that I wasn't likely to make it overnight. I was likely to really pass away within a few hours, if not faster. And so um, I'm going to stop there and then I'll fast forward to 15, 16 years later. Um, when I was about 14, 15 years old, um, I began to have dreams of an event in my life where I was, it was a constant dream and I was seeing myself in a hospital of this very old hospital somewhere very far away. It wasn't in the States. Um, I remember seeing my mother and some family members and they were all very young and being drawn to that room and being drawn to the patient in that room, which was basically this six month old baby. And realizing at that point that I was experiencing a dream where, whereby I was reliving an event in my life when I was extraordinarily young. And it became pretty clear, very, very clear that in the dream, I was, I was watching myself in this little incubator and realizing that this little body was not doing very well and really attaching myself emotionally and, and vibrationally to all the energy in the room. Um, specifically my mother's. And so 
immediately throughout these visions because I had them multiple times. And when I call them, I say visions because sometimes I would have them just as I would wake up in the morning and I would be very lucid in my in my sort of state of mind. And um, and so I would have them there, but they were always the same. I was in this hospital room. I was watching this event play out. I was very attached to my mother. I could feel her feelings. I could sense her thoughts. Um, I could sense her energy and and I could sense the energy in the room. And so when the doctor came in, told her that I was going to uh, pass away, um, asked if he could bring in the the uh, the chaplain, the priest and and perform the, the last rites with the family. Um, the shifting in the energy was the thing that I felt the most. At that point, my mother literally, her stream of consciousness disconnected from that conversation. And it was as though she was in a hypnotic state and she felt possessed to go uh, down to a church just a few blocks away. And um, as she got to the church, she got on her knees and crawled on her knees into the church in a very deep prayer meditated type of way um made it up to the up to the altar and what i and what i remember is is how i would shift around it was very easy for me to move um in this space and i remember that the energy around her was 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 incredibly loving and she wasn't praying for necessarily for for a miracle she was actually kind of more it was more of a of this sort of gratitude and appreciation that she was expressing for just the short time that i had been alive it it was a thank you to whatever it was that she was praying to for the short time and every time she did that the room would change in energy the it it, it got calmer and calmer as she was going through this and I could see what she was seeing in her mind. And I could see that she was given this visual of what I was going to look like had I lived. And so she got to see me grow up and she got to see me become a father and she got to see me become the man that I am. And, and all along, she, all she kept doing was just this deep mantra of gratitude and when the vision disappeared, the whole room changed and it became very quiet, very peaceful, very loving, very embracing. And she knew at that moment, she was at complete peace. And she knew at that moment that she was going to go back to the hospital. And regardless of what the outcome was, she was going to be perfectly fine with it. She just had that in her. And when she went back to the hospital, there were people that waited for her at the entrance. Some of them were the hospital staff. And um, they were crying, but they weren't crying because I had died. They were crying because in that short period of time that she was gone, a, a miracle of sorts happened. And everything that was collapsing, my, my organs and everything were shutting down. When she left, everything came back and my vitals came back. And the doctors didn't do any of this. They were just kind of sitting and watching. And they basically told my mother that what had happened at that moment was a miracle. And back then and even still today that's how sort of the medical community works right i mean if they have an explanation they'll give it to you and if not they just go okay we can't explain it must be a miracle let's move on and she was very 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 devout catholic um she everybody was like okay it had to be a miracle i we, we that's fine with us and so nobody talked about it um at all i was never told any of this until much until much much later when i brought it up so the other half of that was that i had also these other dreams and visions going on at the same time and i saw what had happened to that to that child to to what to that infant as it died and it went to the other side so to speak i saw myself being lifted out of the body and i saw myself moving into this beautiful, beautiful area of light. But as I got closer into that light, I realized that I was no longer in that hospital room. I was in this huge desert. Don't ask me why. It was just a huge, huge desert. 
as far as you can see. And I could see that there were people um, that were looking at me, but they weren't really looking at me as I was sort of above them and I was kind of descending. They were looking through me. And what they could see, what, what I noticed is that when they were looking through me, I looked behind me and I saw this beautiful orb. And I remember the first thing I remember was that telling myself was, why isn't this hurting me? You know, like it should be like burning my eyes. And um, eventually the orb overcame me. It just kind of engulfed me. And as it engulfed me, I could feel my body just shaking. Every cell in my body just was, was ready to explode as if it was like really thirsty for this light. It's the only way I could explain it because it felt like there was some sense of consciousness coming at me from every part of me. And, um, and when it finally engulfed me, I could see that there were these silhouettes around me of images of, of people, but they weren't really people. They, they didn't have the characteristics of people. I, I couldn't see faces. I couldn't see eyes, fingers. I could just make out a silhouette. But what was really, really interesting about that was that these two, these three or four stood out and they came at toward me. And as they got closer to me, I felt this enormous amount of like, I was already feeling this enormous amount of light and love and what have you. They came in and they gave me this, this beautiful hug. And at that point, I literally blew up. I mean, that's the only way I could explain it. I blew up. I sensed myself becoming one with everything in in that space and i could feel myself being light and i knew these people these beings from every aspect of my lives from all over the place not from here on earth but from every place from every dimension from every yeah i mean everywhere it was everywhere i knew them and i looked around and there were infinite number of beings everywhere they were everywhere and i knew them all and they knew me but that wasn't the only thing that caught my sort of my eye sort of speak my interest was but while i was there i felt like this entity was was kind of guiding me through this and it didn't really say a whole whole lot but at that point the entity would ask me what do you see and I remember at first kind of being a little bit annoyed by it because I was so like caught up in this beautiful thing that was happening. I didn't really pay attention to it, but it kept asking me, what do you see? What do you see? And so I kept looking around and I could see that I would see like infinite streams of individual light beings. And I could see that, you know, they were everywhere and they went forever, everywhere in every direction, every direction. And then it dawned on me what it was that they were trying to get me to focus on. And at the moment that they did that, I got whisked out of that space. And I went going backwards into this, you know, this thing that people always talk about, the proverbial, you know, tunnel of light and just being whisked back away from there. And then the next thing I knew, almost inevitably with every one of these dreams, I was back in my body and always kind of very confused and always very disappointed sad crying bawling that i had to come back <laughs> so when i um so when i finally confronted my mother cuz i had to talk to somebody about this um she told me that everything that i had seen in the hospital <laughs> excuse me the conversations were exactly the way they played out and she was shocked been not surprised. <laughs> Sorry. Um, have a drink if you can. Yeah, take a drink. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Yeah. Have a little drink. <laughs> oh, that was good. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, she told me that, and um, she told me to share it with people because <clears throat> she thought that this was as much a miracle as what had happened that day. But there was no way I was going to share this with anybody. I mean, this was before people were embracing this stuff, okay, a little bit better. Did it make sense to you? Did it... No, not at all. No. Uh, not at all. That's the other reason why I wasn't going to go sit in, you know, with somebody in a room in a chair and try to explain this because I knew <clears throat> I couldn't understand it myself. 
it was way beyond this world um, to be able to to envision an event that happened 15, 16 years earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, in such detail. And then to have had the event of dying and coming back, that just wasn't heard of back then. You were either prescribed some serious medication or you were told that you were um, having some demonic experience of some kind. I mean, whatever. It just wasn't something you talked about, especially if you didn't understand it yourself. Yeah. And it's it okay. brings up a, a couple what? of things for me, um, Franco. <laughs> One, I don't know how well those stories would have gone down in a Chicago bar at that point. Um, but more, more Not unless you had a lot of beer. Yeah, then... not unless not unless you'd really gone to that to that place. Um, <laughs> the other thing is about sort of realms versus dreams uh, and about the nature of time itself. Because yes. I appreciate Gary's question actually was very salient about how did this feel to you and how did you start to put this all back together or did you at that time do that? But just to touch on quickly, there's two areas just because they're interesting to me. Hopefully they might be to others. Um, in in my own books and work and whatever, I talk a lot about. Um, the dreamscape being actually realms rather than anything different, really, than the reality. We're in a realm here and we go into another realm or many, many other realms, which actually are just as comparable. While you're asleep, they're just as real. It's only when you, quote, unquote, wake up that they're no longer real. So, so there's that aspect. And the other aspect is the aspect of time, because I know that you're saying this about there being 15 years between those two events. But, of course, when time falls away, as it does in these sort of crescendo experiences um, and in those other realms time is also different um, actually there is no 15 years between, and, and the only reason I'm, I'm saying that I'm not picking you up on that I'm only saying that because I get the sense that you're absolutely aware of that too so I just well I just throw them into the into the uh, conversation yeah no it's you're you're very perceptive um, it, it didn't hit me at that time how to even begin to question something like that. But to answer your question, as I know it now, uh, from just not just those experiences, but my my willingness to to surrender to my psychic abilities, um, is that time does not exist beyond beyond this, let's call it reality. Um, so, you there's no sense of time there's no sense of space there's a sense of only now and so anything happens in the now so imagine imagine if you will being able to to stand oh say let's say i apologize i i do things in feet i know you guys do it in the other it's all fine, it's all fine. Yeah. so it's like so imagine yourself being like 30 feet up okay maybe maybe 100 feet like 10 stories and allowing yourself to to as you fall away from that moment of of time, you you see that your life is just a, a string of events that are happening all in the now. OK, and if you could if you could see that, then you know that it's not difficult for your conscious mind to to transfer itself and its intention and attention from one aspect of what we would call linear time to another aspect of linear time that is happening at the exact same moment. So that's how your consciousness moves around in this reality, in this reality, meaning a linear reality. When you go into the fourth and fifth dimensions, time and space begin to take, well, first of all, we, we time and space change. So we used to always say, you know, we're in time and space, time, space. Now you hear people talk about space, time, and it's not by accident, not that they know necessarily that they're saying it, but as you move higher into the higher realms of the, well, let's say the third dimensions is not that high, but let's say you go into the fourth dimensional streams of consciousness where time really has no relevance um, it's still here in this reality, but you start to see that that the time has sort of multiple personalities. For instance, you can go through it like this, like what we all do, you know, point A to point B. And one day you'll say, oh, wow, that week flew by, right? It's like 
all of a sudden I'm here, it's Friday again, and it was just Friday yesterday. And it's like, oh, you know, that week just went by. But as you get into the fourth and fifth dimension, especially even in the fourth, you start to realize, wait a minute, that time did fly. But man, I met I met him or her last Friday at a bar. And that feels like it was a year ago. And it feels like all of a sudden, now, even though it flew, you know, linearly fast, it's starting to take a characteristic of this, a waviness. And the higher you go into the realms of dimensions, you go from linear to waviness, and it starts to go from linear time to waviness space. So now it becomes space time. And by the time you get into the fifth dimensions and higher, those two things don't exist anymore. So that's a long-winded way of answering your question, but it's a, I gave you two sort of perspectives of how to no, look no, at it. It was a great, it's a, it's a great, um, th the way you've come back is perfect because it wasn't really a question. It was more just throwing something else into the mix. So I like the fact that you didn't, you know, just answer in a few words. It requires, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, all of this and to touch on your books and all the other things that we'd love to do with you at some point, they probably require other recordings if if we ever get around yeah. together and if you want to come back to do that. But this is a great just um, I think this is a wonderful uh, introduction to one what what quote unquote happened to you right in time um, and then how you started to put those pieces sort of back together mm -hmm. to be able to live with them and not only just to be able to live with them but to hopefully to thrive with them. So I'm now interested about what, what then then happened as you started to. Put this back you had the conversation with your mother and that uh, yeah. it's wonderful actually that she reacted by the sound of it in the way that she did and then of course quote unquote life went on from there so i'd love to hear how that next phase was G gary have you before um franco um, maybe talks about some of that is there anything that you're picking up now that you think would be be valuable it's probably deviates too much because <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, it's just that um, well, we've been meaning to discuss, delve deeper into these dimensions and things, really, and what, what that, what that. Means. I'll tell you. I'll, I'll tell you what, guys. I'll I'll just give you a little flavor mm. of that deviation. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Mm. Right. Thank you. So, there are really sort of three aspects to consciousness in the realm of what we're dealing with here. There is the, the, um, the multiverse. Um, there is the multidimensional and, and then there is, there is the parallel realities and they're all different. Um, <clears throat> the parallel realities are a function or a product of every thought, every emotion that we have. Um, it's, let's, let me take you back to that image of yourself being pulled back into, you know, 10 stories up and you're seeing your life like a strip of film okay and it's happening all at the same time if you were to come back down and you landed on that strip of film and you just were on one frame of that reality you would notice around you that there were just a library an infinite library of opportunities that are there for you to access by virtue of simply using your thought and your emotion to draw from them. And as soon as you do that, it lays down like a railroad track. It lays down the next frame. And depending on what you are experiencing at that moment, you will either continue on what you will feel is the main track or it starts to deviate in various directions. And so that's the world of the parallel realities in that there's infinite number of parallel realities we're living, but this is the primary one. This is where we pull from all of the other ones and we activate them in a sense into this reality. Franco, I don't know how you feel about it, that, but in, <clears throat> in the books that I wrote, the graphic novels that I wrote, um, I called that base camp effectively. <laughs> that we have I, this I like that, base camp. Yeah, we have a sort of sense that there's a there is a base camp and that this is yeah. this. Not to say it's a, a better reality or more real or anything. It just <laughs> appears that sort of uh, you know our, our compass can bring us back here. So 
I like, I very much like the fact that you just. Uh, yeah. I, and I love the fact you call it base camp. I actually wrote it down. I, I'm hoping I'll be able to use it somewhere along the way, but I love that because this is like whatever you're experiencing in the moment, whatever you pull from any of the parallel realities, the, it, it gets drawn back into the main thread and it becomes your base camp again. In other words, it is always going to be the new reality every moment that you are experiencing you're experiencing literally i'm not exaggerating about a trillion realities that fold into this kind of like you remember how in the old days that you'd have even i guess today still if you drew if you drew a cartoon character and then you did that on a hundred pieces of paper and then you then you kind of went like zzz, you know and they decided to come to life um, I forget what's that called, but anyway, Flick, flicker books in the UK, we call them flicker books. I don't know. About okay. Yeah. I can't remember what they are here, yeah. but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. You, you could take something that looks stationary, but you put it together in now we're not talking a hundred pages. We're talking literally a trillion mm -hmm. that happen in a moment. A moment is much smaller than, than a moment that we like a second it's much smaller than a nanosecond it's much smaller than than a plank moment it's much smaller than that within that moment all of these streams of reality come flying in folds together and it gives you the sense of motion like as if you were in a linear time space reality yeah. and that's all folding back in, into the camp the base camp and that and becomes does that does bring me very much to the thought of, uh, which I suppose isn't too much of a deviation, of the sort of fatalistic notion of, of life and the universe and so on. Um, but I don't, I never see that as being, uh, as the fatalistic thing of, of being something that actually is bad or preset somehow, that, that that and free will weirdly can coexist. I wonder well, I, how you feel about that. I don't know how they couldn't. Yeah. Um, the reason that if I'm, if I'm tracking what you're saying in the fatalistic stuff is that when you have that consciousness of that mind stream, okay, the thought forms, I call them when you have them and they're simply constantly reinforcing, and this is the third reality we're talking third 3d reality. Okay. You're constantly re reinforcing what is around you. It just pulls from it pulls the the universe. We'll call it the universe for now, but it's a greater scheme, a greater sense of consciousness. It will just pull. Okay, you know, you have a fatalistic approach to life. Oh, there's plenty of here, and it just pulls, and it goes, Ch -ch 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 -ch. and it does it because it doesn't have. It's indifferent if that's the way you view it. You know, it's still used as the same mind form, the same emotional stream. To pick it up and the one thing i will tell you is that every single one of those that collapses on top of each other every single one okay um in that one moment are independent of each other so if people could understand the magnitude of that i will try to explain the magnitude of that it means that this second and the second ahead of us and the second ahead of us is filled with what what was told to me as defining moments. So you, you a defining moment is when you finally make a conscious decision to do something different. Just that's the broad definition of it, okay? In the spiritual realm, every moment of your life is a defining moment. Every moment of your life is independent of the previous moment. Therefore, you can make enormous changes to your life in a moment because you have created a new shift in parallel reality. It well, actually, not... that's that's the only time that you could make a, a change in your life, isn't it? In the moment anyway. Every so... moment. Yeah. yeah. Every moment is that powerful. It's enormously powerful. I mean, it is absolutely powerful. And that's unfortunate because we don't appreciate the moment. And unfortunately, if we did, we knew how powerful it was. We'd be doing it all the time because we could literally change not just our reality, but we could literally change the human reality overnight. It's very now, prevalent thought at the moment, given that there's mm -hmm. so many people in this sort of, um, in some sort of stacking phase, like uh, sort of waiting for things to happen, which I totally understand. 
because I've I've had those moments, and I know Gary has, and many of us have had this thing of look, we believe that things are lining up to work out in a perfect way. I still believe that, but I I now believe or think um, or feel more importantly feel that you can uh, you can take action, right? Oh, or absolutely. You can make different choices. Yeah. So this gets back, and I think I can make this point in the time we have. Um, this gets back to what drew you guys to wanting to have a conversation which was the question about god okay um if we what would i do with i i teach this thing called the way of the inner child it's a practice that has been lost for thousands of years but it's a simple practice and one of the first concepts that one has to not just grapple with but actually accept if you want to play within this concept of the way of the inner child is that you must understand that you are God. You are God. And this is all a playground of sorts, a game, a dream state game. Okay. That if you can start from there, you have to start from there. You can't say, Hmm, let me get back to you on that. Well, I'm just talking about use your imagination to use this practice for this moment, now hopefully it's not just while I'm with a student or something, but you start to incorporate it in into your way of being. And if you can start from there, you can start to realize how every moment as you realize yourself, as you become aware of yourself consciously, every moment you can have drastic impacts on the world. And I always tell people lately, especially as I've been on shows like this, that the irony is that we've been spending our entire lives and centuries and millennia waiting for something magical to happen somewhere out here and waiting and saying, yeah, everything is coming together. And yeah, you know, it's feeling good. And yeah, it looks like the light, you know, the stars are aligned. All of that is true. But what the irony of all this is that the only thing that we have ever really been waiting for is us to wake up and when we wake up we realize that we're god having an experience in a dream state called the game that now we're at that point where the things that are lining up are giving us the sense of awareness to be able to ask those questions and to actually actually embrace them it may be difficult for a lot of people but to actually embrace them and, become, and raise the conscious stream of awareness so that we as a collective, and really it doesn't have to be a collective, it could be individually, we are starting to accept the possibility more than accept because we can't, we can't just accept, we can't just know, we have to become it. And then every moment of what we were talking about, we start to realize that in every moment we could change the course of human history if we could use that stream of consciousness to know how to do that. Everything is frequency. Everything is coding. You have to know the coding by knowing the frequency to lock into it. But once you do that and you do it like a little kid, everything is over. And so I, everything I tell people is that the world is going to change drastically in the next five to 10 years. I mean, drastically. Mm. And it's how do you do that? It's impossible. Look at we didn't We didn't make that much ground in five, 10 years. I said, you're not understanding that we're talking frequency here and as consciousness awakening itself to itself. And this is how consciousness began in the beginning. Let's call it the beginning when energy became aware of itself as consciousness, we're doing the same thing. And when that happened, well, what happened there? Universes began no different here. Changes will happen overnight, literally while we sleep. And 10 years from now will not look like anything like this not even close we've been waiting for ourselves to wake up as god yeah the idea of us being the cavalry is a is a rather wonderful idea in a way it's sort of horrific to think that we've been waiting for ourselves so long but on the other it hand, is but that's it's the perfect gift you know it, it's the irony of all ironies right mm -hmm. it's the game the game of contrast it feels like that and uh, if it if it helps the audience at all, I mean, a few years ago, I I wouldn't have had any concept of what you're talking about. But 
there's been such a change within me that I can I start to get little understanding some of this <laughs> and feel yeah, right. it. It's, it is coming through and bits and pieces. And it's like, okay, so I feel that process inside. If you, you know, it's a journey and it's a it's a long one. It has been, but but the acceleration over the last few years has been on myself at least immense, and I can imagine on a a lot more people and that's just going to escalate i i believe yeah absolutely imagine what you've just gone through and now imagine it being more global and imagine it speeding up a thousand times faster um you're you're spot on the way that you share that because this is as i i want to i just kind of sugarcoat a little i kind of just brush over it but this is all about frequency and frequency in in the spiritual realm is all about conscious energy and conscious energy is about awareness and awareness is about knowing yourself as as god as something you know you don't in this world we use the terms god and all that but in that realm it's just you are what you are you know um and because you're picking it up it's because in the frequency of what we use as words there there are thought forms and symbols and this gets into all sorts of other things called sacred geometry and stuff but in that coding and that signaling it's triggering codes of remembering in you and, and in you and and in anyone who's listening here and whoever picks it up later that's what you do that's what like i know that when i came back from my nde which i forgot to mention i was also i forgot to mention a pretty big piece of it which was when i came in i switched souls so i'm a walk-in and so i came here with a specific purpose and by permission of that soul that was leaving. And my purpose was to share the truth, not my truth, but the truth that's been spoken in so many different ways and so many different languages and in so many different civilizations and so many different times. It's everywhere. Mathematical truth, if you want to go there, sacred geometry truth, archaeological, historical truth, religious truth, they all point to the same thing. So what you're talking about is happening to everybody because they know truth. Truth is truth, no matter what. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. It's embedded in you, like coding. Right. Well, I think that's a lovely place, actually. Yeah. To well, I notice that we're running out of time. That's been. Um, I think that's been fantastic. And one thing I would say is that um, you were very kind in that you were talking about the audience and so on, and those people that listen and pick this up. Um, and I'm sure you'd agree with this anyway, Franco. It, people don't even have to hear this. The no. fact that it's said, the words actually can be en- energy of the words and the words themselves. Um, the fact that we can speak this type of truth now, um, that in itself actually is enough to unlock these different uh, changes. You bet. You bet. You bet. So anyway, guys, I guess until the next time. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. there's a lot to uncover. Yeah. yeah. Um, still. Um, Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, you're welcome. We'll talk the next time. Take Fantastic. care. Lovely. Thank you, Franco. Thank you very much. Take Bye-bye. care, everybody. Bye-bye.